Amen. I'm going to take a little time to offer some reflections this evening because we have to talk about Israel. How do we talk about Israel? I want to start with the stories, the human stories. I want to start by remembering that there are hundreds of thousands of moderate Israelis and Arabs and Palestinians who did not ask for this and do not want this. I want to start by remembering that in the midst of the media reports that tell us how many died and which violent extremist attacked which other violent extremist in the cities and towns within Israel, there are other realities that don't make the headlines. For example, as reported in the forward yesterday, there was a Facebook post by Israeli politician Yair Lapid that provided some perspective when he wrote, the rioters in Lod and Eka don't represent every Israeli Arab, the rioters in Bat Yam and the members of La Familia, La Ahava, don't represent Israel's Jews. Yesterday, Jews and Arabs across Israel came together on the Chemed Bridge near Abu Ghosh, just outside of Jerusalem, as well as in several other cities. Hundreds of Jews and Arabs from surrounding villages came together with music and dancing and flags and flowers, all to show that they refused to hate one another. And the people who gathered seemed very ordinary, mums, dads, kids, grandparents, neighbors joining together to demonstrate that what you see on the news does not define them. Here's another human story. This one from Rabbi Stacy Blank from Jerusalem that she shared in her blog, which I'm going to excerpt from here. She writes, thanks to everyone who's reached out in the past two days to see if we are okay. We are okay, thanks. But we, the Israelis and the Palestinians in this tiny land, are not okay. Throughout the week, I heard about confrontations between Israeli police and Muslims on the Temple Mount, the Dome of the Rock, as this coincided with the final days of Ramadan. I heard about the protests in Sheikh Jarrah, about ejecting Palestinians from their homes for Jewish settlers. I admit I don't have an analysis of how these situations became so violent. I chose on Jerusalem Day to preserve the daily routine of my kids, so I did not participate in the distribution of flowers by Jews to Palestinians in the old city in East Jerusalem led by Tag Meir. Instead, I sent them a donation to support the efforts. I picked up my kids from school, then I returned with a seven-year-old to our first school event since Corona, which coincided with parent-teacher conferences. The kids played games and the parents chatted, and it was a joyous reunion. And then I took my son to the community center for judo. While he was inside, I started a Zoom call with a family from the United States who hoped to hold a bar mitzvah in Jerusalem next year. And people were organizing a blood drive in the yard. Then the siren started. We all looked at each other, hesitated, and then our instincts kicked in. I disconnected the conversation. I walked quickly inside the building. Someone shouted, everybody should go down the stairs to check if the bomb shelter is open. I waited for my son to come out of the judo room. I took his hand, pushed through the people who were just standing there and went down the stairs. I called to people to follow us. The bomb shelter was open and we all went inside. The kids asked, is this real? They were too young to remember the summer, summer of 2014. I felt my post-trauma kicking in. I couldn't make phone calls, but my texts went through. I texted my husband to get in touch with my other kids. My daughter was still at basketball, the peace players at the YMCA. My son was biking home and was in the middle of the street with no building accessible. But my husband spoke to him and told him what he needed to do if in such a situation again. We acknowledged how scary it was. After 10 minutes passed, my son returned to judo. We go on. Afterwards, we spoke about it. Why were people sending rockets? There have been wars in the past. One side lost. Some people want to make peace and work to live together. Some want to continue the war, and this is what they do. Our country knows how to protect itself and us, and we all do our part to help each other be safe. Then the rockets started to hit Israel near Gaza. Yesterday, in the afternoon, I was made aware of an incident at my children's school of pupils who sang racist songs about, Ar about Arabs and drew Palestinian flags and ripped them up. My daughter and other children told them that they opposed these racist acts and to stop. 
The pupils called them names that I won't write here. My daughter informed the teacher who spoke with them. I listened to the radio. An Arab police officer from Lod was being interviewed and he explained that the riots were groups of young people. He told them they were trying to calm things down and the police can't be everywhere. He said all sides need to take part in calming things down and he called on the elders of the community to go out and help to stop the violence, to be personal examples. The interviewer challenged him and said it wasn't enough. And then, then came on the radio the principal of the Ort High School in Lod, at which Nadine Awad, the girl killed by the rocket, was a student in 10th grade. She spoke in perfect Hebrew. She spoke of Nadine apologizing for the cliche as an outstanding student who participated in science competitions and cooperations between Arabs and Jews, whose sister is a teacher in the school. She described her as a young woman proud of her Islam and seeking to help people connect with its exalted principles. She said, tonight is the holiday Eve, Eid al-Fitr. There is no holiday for us. She called upon everyone, take responsibility, she said. We have no other land, we have no other city. We have to make sure there is a future for our children. These are the human stories. And I want us to focus on those and remember that just as those who led an insurrection at the Capitol in DC don't represent who we are, the news stories that highlight the acts of extremists and racists and terrorists do not represent all Israelis, Arabs, and Palestinians. But how did we get here? What is going on? There are a number of complex intersecting pieces, and I would recommend that you read the articles that Rabbi Iderson and I assembled and sent out with last night's email, as I'm not going to go into all of the depths and details tonight, but I will try and paint in broad strokes a better understanding about certain matters that you may have heard about in the media, cited as the cause of the unrest. Let's begin with the matter of home evictions in Sheikh Jarrah, near the old city of Jerusalem. Today, Sheikh Jarrah is a predominantly Palestinian neighborhood in East Jerusalem, roughly a mile from the old city. I have visited there. There are currently 3,000 people or so who call the neighborhood home. The neighborhood is old, it's ancient, with the first records showing up in the 12th century. Historians say for thousands of years there had been a permanent Jewish presence living in Sheikh Jarrah next to the tomb of Shimon Hatzadik, also known as Simeon the Just who was a Jewish high priest during the time of the Second Temple. He died in the third century BCE. His tomb and the surrounding compound was purchased in 1875 by the Sephardic Community Committee and the Ashkenazi Assembly of Israel. Now, after the War of Independence, that area fell under Jordanian control. As a result of the war, 2,000 Jews fled or were expelled from the eastern part of Jerusalem, while 20,000 Palestinians fled or were expelled from West Jerusalem. And in 1956, Jordan relocated 28 Palestinian families who had been displaced during the War of Independence to Sheikh Jarrah. The move was approved by the United Nations Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees, and the organization stipulated that the families would be given ownership of their homes after three years, which would then end their refugee status. The Jordanian government, though, never formally transferred over the property rights to those Palestinian families. So fast forward now to the 1970s, and the, after the 67 war, and Jewish organizations who had purchased land in 1875 wanted to reassert their ownership. And the case has been in legal proceedings since the 1970s. What makes these cases complicated is that in 1980, Israel passed a law that provides a means for Jews to reclaim land and homes that were lost after 48. But of course, Palestinians are not afforded those same rights. And additionally, Israel officially annexed East Jerusalem. But as you may well be aware, their control of that part of Jerusalem is not internationally recognized around the world. Therefore, many international bodies, when they're reporting on this, see the eviction of Palestinian residents from those homes as illegal. What might just be a land ownership case making its way through the courts 
has now become extremely politicized. And there's a larger context of settler groups leading the charge to move more Jews into East Jerusalem for strategic reasons that personally I think is unlikely to help in the cause for peace. While this has been a long-standing and complicated legal case, it received outsized attention in a way that inflamed and contributed to what is now happening because a legal decision impacting several households in Sheikh Jarrah was due to come down on Jerusalem Day, the day that the reunification of Jerusalem is celebrated in Israel. And groups of right-wing Jewish nationalists had planned to march through the old city, specifically with, the, th with their flags through the Damascus Gate, which is the primary entryway into the old city from East Jerusalem and through the Muslim quarter. This at the same time that the police had been putting up entry points at the Damascus Gate and limiting Arab access to the Al-Aqsa Mosque in the lead up to the end of Ramadan, which had caused for the last few weeks young Arab men to riot and protest. Just think back to that terrible tragedy just a couple of weeks ago when the police did not prevent 100,000 Jews from cramming unsafely into the site at Mount Moron at Lagba Omer, and you can understand where some of this frustration may have come from. So tensions were high already. Now it's times like these that good leadership can turn down the temperature and help to restore the calm. But that's not what happened here. It would seem that Netanyahu miscalculated the intensity of feelings and let the situation fester, as historically he has gained more support when showing strength in putting down uprisings. He called off the Flag Day march only at the last minute. And he has also ignored calls from within Israeli society, including from the Israeli Religious Action Center, one of our partners in the reform movement, to speak out against extremist Jewish anti-Arab groups, such as this group Lahava, who have been emboldened in recent years and who have led mob attacks on Is Arabs within Israel, along with young Arab mobs responding in kind towards Jews. And so we've had these attacks taking place in towns all around Israel where people have been coexisting peacefully for a very long time. Now, within the Palestinian community, Fatah again postponed elections that are now about 10 years overdue. Hamas took advantage of their weakness and started inflaming Arabs to riot in Israel, using social media to stir up those passions, focusing on the threatened evictions in Sheikh Jarrah and the police response to the riots at the Al-Aqsa Mosque. So they too chose to inflame the situation for what they perceived to be their political gain. And then they started firing rockets indiscriminately into Israel, over 1,700 of them as of today. Now let there be no doubt, Israel has to respond to this level of attack from Hamas. These cycles will likely continue unless Hamas is truly brought down and at this moment, none of the choices are good. If Israel sends in ground troops to Gaza, they might succeed in truly damaging Hamas, but with loss of Israeli soldier lives and harm to many Palestinian civilians who will be caught up in it all. The international community will likely push for a ceasefire, which will bring an end to the harm in the short term, but will leave Hamas able to do this all over again in a few years. And so the cycle will continue. The tragedy is that it never had to come to this, but now it has. At times like these, we are meant to offer prayers, and I'm not sure what good a prayer is at this moment, other than to turn our hearts in compassion to all who are suffering and hope for the safety and security of Israel and her citizens. So instead, I'm going to offer this poem by Yehuda Amichai. It's called Jerusalem. On a roof in the old city, laundry hanging in the late afternoon sunlight, the white sheet of a woman who is my enemy, the towel of a man who is my enemy, to wipe off the sweat of his brow. In the sky of the old city, a kite. At the other end of the string, a child I can't see because of a wall. 
We have put up many flags. They have put up many flags to make us think that they are happy, to make them think that we are happy. <laughs>